Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. The Sikkim 365 Radio Live Guest VIP Hotline is sponsored by Stonewood Dental. We are all in this together. All right, uh, we have uh, Jed Drenning joined us on Monday as we try to bounce around as much as we can with various programs who have a, a chance or are a part of whatever's going on right now in the landscape of college football. We've heard from so many of you, Brigham Young in West Virginia, UCF in Memphis, among others. Tony Caridi, voice of West Virginia, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio with Craig Paul and, and also I'm David Smoke. Tony, thank you very much. What is the atmosphere or the temperature right now among Mountaineers fans or even the athletic department about what's happened the last two weeks? Well, David, as you might imagine, extremely high level of interest uh, as to what's going to happen. Unfortunately, we're kind of getting used to this. Uh, it was about uh, 11, 12 years ago where we went through this when the Big East Conference um, blew up. And that was, to be quite honest with you, that was even more of a tense time because you just had no idea as to where you were going to land. And uh, the biggest worry was that, you know, again, what we're looking at right now is that financially uh, you could be left out. And back in that day, uh, West Virginia brought in about approximately $10 million a year from the Big East Conference. And the concern was that someone was going to get left out. In that particular case, it was Connecticut. And if you take a look at what happens, what has happened to UConn over the last decade, it hasn't been good. So we were certainly concerned that that could have been West Virginia. Instead, as you well know, uh, we ended up in the Big 12. And financially, it was a huge increase. And to be quite honest with you, it's been a wonderful fit as we get ready for year number 10. And so now fans, I think, are just taking a very, very um, cautious look and a wait and see to see how all this unfolds. If there is this partnership with the Pac-12 or, or, or something like that, how much would that affect where, where West Virginia would want to go in the future, given that they probably wouldn't have to go all the way out to the West Coast all that often, but the fact that they would have to for not just one or two football games a year, but for, you know, baseball and basketball and everything else that are, are midweek sports. I think that at this point in this craziness that we've all created or the college people that have been putting these leagues together have created over the last decade, I think geography no longer is even on the, uh, on the calendar. And I think that to answer your question, the two biggest things would be, do you have an opportunity to remain in the status of what we're now calling a power five school? One, do you have that opportunity to compete, to play in the playoff? And secondly, financially, where does that put you? As you guys have seen, the speculation is that you could go from potentially making 35, 37, 38 million in the Big 12, and now those numbers have been reported to be anywhere between 15, 16, 17 million dollars. So I think for West Virginia, geography aside, it's do you still maintain the status as one of the big boys, and financially, can you stay in the neighborhood with the other leagues? And financially, we know that grant of rights has Oklahoma and Texas locked in for the foreseeable future, and, and therefore the thought of these eight schools sticking together for as long as possible. Now, I think we all know that if you know the ACC or someone was to come call a certain member, that they're going to have to listen to that phone call, Tony. But what do you think the odds are, at least from West Virginia's perspective, of these eight actually kind of just standing their ground, picking up some big paychecks here sooner rather than later, and seeing where the waters are kind of churning you know, in a couple of years? That's all going to be determined not by those eight schools, but by the other leagues. And by that, I mean, do those other schools, what's the next move? You know, people, you know, I do a talk show as well, and people call and they text and they ask the question, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I maintain this. No one knows, including the people who will ultimately make that decision. And if they do right now, today, as we talk, say they know they're lying because the pieces have not come together yet. And so, you know, it's totally um, hypothetical as to what those eight schools would do until someone makes a move. So to answer your question, if staying together as eight 
is the best situation for everyone involved, then the eight will stay together. And if that's not the case, then you will start to see a move. I mean, it's, it's this great fundamental question. Um, how loyal should you, can you be to your league? How loyal should you be to your own institution? And as a result of that, you know, the, uh, that's what makes these things um, so difficult to, to try to put together is because you're trying to say, hey, we're together. And at the same time, you know that from an institutional standpoint, your, your charge and your mission is to do what's best for your institution. So it's, it's, a, it's a really a, a catch-22 situation for these schools. And, you know, if you want to speak about it, David, on even a bigger issue, and guys, on a bigger issue on this deal, it's so sad to me to see where this has all, where this has all gotten, you know, has, has gotten to. Um, if there's not a place for the Baylors, the K-States, the Oak States, and the West Virginias, and the TCUs, and Texas Techs, if there's not a place for those schools, then there's something inherently wrong with the world and the business that we're in in college football. And the reason why this game is so beloved is specifically for the passion that it generates and the rivalries through the years. Let's face it, a lot of these schools, all of it, you know, they, they know that uh, the chance to win a national championship on a year to year basis is extremely, extremely rare and difficult. However, Every time this year, what happens to us? We get all fired up and we get all excited because yep. of the opportunity. And whether you know you don't win a national championship or not, it's a big deal if Baylor beats Texas that year or Baylor beats TCU or back in the day, if West Virginia beat Pitt or West Virginia beat Virginia Tech or West Virginia beat Maryland. Those are the things. Those are the little jewels that we have and we carry, and that's what keeps us going. And so if there's no longer a place in the game for that, and yet we're going to f- form this, this very elite thing, the, the, the future of this game is not bright. If that's going to be the case, if it's a 30 team league or this, you know, that's what they're talking about. And that's the long term play on this thing because the little kids growing up in Waco or in Stillwater or in Morgantown, they will not have that passion because the care will no longer be there because you don't have an opportunity to participate. You don't have that dog in the fight. And over the long term, people will become disinterested and this game will, will lessen itself. And that's the bad thing. I could not have said it better, Tony. Yeah, for real. I really couldn't have. I, I've tried for the last couple of weeks or even when there's been other discussion. And, and I know that a lot of people look at the overall, like, who's going to play for the national champion. And it's a little different in the NCAA in basketball. There's 350 teams. And yet sure. there's that dream of making it and winning a conference title and getting to the dance. And who knows if you're going to be, you know, Cinderella for at least a weekend or two. And I, I, I don't think I could have summed it up much better than that. Absolutely. No question. If, if yeah, it, yeah, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, well, my, my, my point to all that was, I mean, that's, that's the essence of this game. And I think we all got taken to the side when the 12-team playoff first came out. I'm sure you guys were doing the same thing that we were doing. We're going like, yep. well, heck. Yep. That's a pretty doggone good deal. Now you at least got a shot to get into this thing. Little did we know that it was just yet another calculated plan that made it even more enticing for Oklahoma and Texas to go to the SEC, knowing now that they don't necessarily need to finish one or two to win the league, but they could be one of five or six teams in it. And so that in itself even hurts more getting excited about that possibility and then going, well, it was, you were just getting played is what you were getting. Tony, how did you react to some of the things that uh, came out of the, the Texas Senate hearing on on Monday, I mean, the, the just some. I mean, obviously, there's mean a lot all, of all nine hours yeah. of it, or whatever. There's a lot of political yeah. posturing and and darts being thrown. But you know, Bob Bowlesby being completely caught off guard, sitting on a committees with Greg Sankey and Jay Hartzell and all these people in this working group, and and knowing these things, uh, just uh, just the emotions that that ran through, particularly, I would say, Mac Rhodes and Bob Bowlesby. Well. Again, I was at Big 12 Media Day, and when the commissioner, I thought the commissioner made a really super good point that, you know, because TV households, cable households no longer were the same commodity that they were 10 years ago, that we probably won't see that kind of movement anymore because it was all about households to get Rutgers and to get Maryland to go to the Big Ten. It makes no sense from a competitive standpoint. Those teams aren't 
of that quality, but they were households and they were dollars. So when he said, you know, we got 20 million cord cutters over the last decade, to me, I went like, this is all good because now things will be settled. And the way that it happened, and, you know, Bob Bowlesby says he had absolutely zero inclination that this was in any way in the works. That, to me, is about as close to a mob hit as I've ever seen. I mean, you know, mob guys go to the other mob guys, kids' weddings. They go to their first communions. They go to their funerals. They, uh, you know, they say, hey, what's up? And then they go around the backside and they make a hit. I mean, in a very colorful illustration here, I mean, what was the difference than what we just saw? It's a four-person committee working on the college football playoff. Not a word is said, and you get absolutely shanked. That, to me, I just don't get that aspect of it. If there was anything, it should have been, hey, look, if you're Texas and Oklahoma, we're not happy with what we're doing financially. We have either got to get our number up or we're going to go, okay, I could see that. But not to have a single word and all of a sudden to blow out like that, I just find that just from a from a human nature standpoint, there's something wrong. We just stopped being, I, I don't know when that all started, but you, be a man and, and just stand up and just be a man about it. That to me is, is what really just leaves me shaking my head. Couldn't agree more, Tony, and love the, the mob hit analogy as well. I think that's perfect. Uh, while we have you, Neil Brown heading into year three, Mountaineers were a good team last year, you know, bowl-type team. Uh, what are the expectations? What's kind of the buzz right now as uh, fall camps start to get underway? Uh, excited. Uh, they get together tomorrow for the first time for meetings. They practice Friday. Uh, will be better overall. I don't know what that's going to equate to wins and losses. We went 6-5 last year won the bowl game against Army. And so um, offensive line will be better. A defensive line, we use a great, lose a great player in um, Darius, Stills, Darius Stills, but they feel that they've built those up in his three years that he's been here. Obviously, everyone took a step back because of COVID. So to me, guys, I think anywhere from three through nine in the preseason rankings in the Big 12 on a Saturday, flip a coin. Mm -hmm. Anything could happen. I truly do believe that. And so it's just going to be, uh, I think we'll play a lot of close games. A lot of them will be contingent upon special teams. Um, we'll be better. Exactly how many more W's that means, not sure. Tony, thank you, buddy. Appreciate your time. Thanks for jumping on. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it, can you, it's been two weeks. It's been exactly two weeks ago, an hour ago, when, when that story popped with Brent Zwerneman and the Houston Chronicle. And doesn't it seem like it's been like two months already yeah with it's kind of unbelievable but it's been yeah, two it weeks. yeah hey thanks tony appreciate your time great okay, job guys. as always tony Creedy, voice of west virginia athletics on sikkim 365 radio i agree with uh pretty much everything he said uh, about everything i mean i really do i he he said some things like you mentioned that i i probably couldn't form quite right in my own head but i had been thinking all the same and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with him, and it's kind of what I've been saying for the last few days now when everybody is, uh, you know, talking about, well, what do you think about this team to that conference? And, and it's fun to play around with the idea and think about what, you know, the possibilities are of West Virginia, the ACC, and all those types of things. But uh, like he said, you know, until that next domino falls, it really doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter because – no one's like West Virginia is not tomorrow just going to jump out and go, hey, by the way, we're going to, you know, like we got to see some some movement. You know, does does the ACC make it apparent that they want to add teams? And if they do, then West Virginia is a logical choice potentially. But we don't know if they want to do that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with them. You know, we're, we're kind of wanting to talk in, things into happening, but we have to realize that there's stuff happening behind the scenes but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be public knowledge, you know, anytime soon. So this is something that's definitely going to drag out for the next, you know, however many months. You know what the emotion I had when he was talking about if there's not a place for Texas Tech and Oklahoma State? You know, this thing about the SEC and Oklahoma and Texas means that there are parties that believe that most of college football is dead weight. Mm -hmm. And I don't think as a lifelong college football fan, I see anybody as dead weight. I, I enjoy, like, I enjoy all of it. You know, if, if, if Florida State or uh, if, 
you know, was going to play Oregon in a four year stretch, I'd be like, great. If they're going to play Oregon State, I'd still be like, well, I wish it was Oregon, but that's still cool. It's different. Like, yeah. I, right. I embrace the I embrace the variety of college football. That's what makes it great. Yeah, the atmosphere, uh, the fan bases, which is a part of the atmosphere. You know, I had someone the other day argue with me a little bit about, I said college football was always the regional rivalries, and, and I know it's gone national. I mean, it's always been national. I mean, national champions, whoever you you want to talk about. But uh, that was my phone. Yeah. Um, Eight four three. That's a great interview. Thank, thank you, Tony. So Tony's you were talking a great to somebody guest. about what? Uh, huh? You're talking to somebody about regional rivalries. About the regional and- I, I'm, I'm going to miss part of that. I'm going to miss. I miss some of the rivalries that have been destroyed because of realignment. I, I'm not naive. I understand what's going on, but I, I, I do miss the fact that you can play a schedule and you may not have a chance in hell. But how did Grant Tapp become a legacy at Baylor? In 1974, they won the Southwest Conference Championship with a team that didn't have a chance. No one gave them a chance. They upset Texas and went on to win a Southwest Conference title. Those stories, to me, mean as much in the college football history and tradition as who won the national title. The ones that kind of come out of, well, I still understand it's the big boys, the blue bloods, but that's also part of what is the landscape of the game. Yeah, I mean, Matt Rule's Baylor team uh, two years ago didn't win the national title. They got close to being in the playoff, real close to being in the playoff, uh, but didn't quite make it because they couldn't beat OU in the in the championship game in the Big 12. But that was still a really fun season. Like, that was an enjoyable season. They end up in the Sugar Bowl. They uh, lose to Georgia. And, you know, that was all she wrote. He heads off to Carolina, but that was a fun season. And, and you know, it had there not been, like, the weak buildup leading into that game of him and the Jets and, you know, all that talk, and then that eventually led to, to him going to the NFL, just a different spot than people expected. You know, that kind of tarnished it a little bit, but had that not been involved and that rule been come back, I mean, can you imagine the anticipation for oh. the last season? People would have been going crazy for it. But, yeah, like, there's going to be a lot of programs that now – uh, potentially, if this goes the direction some think it's going, that, yeah, what are you getting excited about? You know, like, what what is there to get excited about? And, and especially, like, at least, you know, even if you were a team that didn't think you had a chance, I mean, I know plenty of people who, who went to bad schools as far as, like, their records on the field and whatnot, and they didn't probably go to a lot of football games, but they'd go to the Texas game. You yep. know, they'd go in A&M. I mean, that was the story of Baylor fans for the longest time. Is like, we're only going to, like, a couple games a year because we know what happens, but... You know, those rivalries, like you said, mattered or, or, you know, let's just see what they do against a team like this. And, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm with him. I, I'm, I have no desire to watch a mini NFL. I, I just don't. Like, what? I know it's fun to see. And, Clemson by the way, and, for those that don't know, Craig is a lifelong Oklahoma fan. He covers the hell out of Baylor in college football. But he loves OU, so he wants them to do well. But that's not something that you're all that thrilled with as far as the mini NFL, even though they'll be a part of the mini NFL. Yeah, I mean, like, they're going to be in the in crowd, and that's that's cool, you know, if that ever happens. And, and I think the SEC move is, is really interesting. I'm not entirely against it uh, for them, but, you know, I'm also very aware of this might not end up like you think it's going to end up. Like, it's going to end up with lots of money in your pockets regardless, but this whole being able to beat your chest year in and year out might not be the case. Uh, and, and people say they're okay with that because money's coming in, but is that money going to your pocket? Fans, it's not going to mine. I don't think it's going to yours either. So I don't know why the money matters to you other than you just feel like it can enhance facilities and get better recruits and, and do all that. But but bottom line, it comes down to wins and losses. And you think you'd be okay going 500 every year in the SEC because your school gets more money or more exposure. But let me tell you, I know a little something about Oklahoma fans and Texas fans and Bam. It ain't going to be okay. You know, that's, that, that might be okay initially, but if that becomes the norm, that's going to be problematic. So I know a lot of people have confidence that won't be the case, but all it takes is like one coaching change or one bad hire or one busted quarterback, and all of a sudden that SEC schedule, it seems like it's going to be so fun, is It'll going to be... It'll get on you be, and lean on you. Yeah, yeah. it's going to just gnaw on you. So, I mean, I'm intrigued by them being in the SEC, but I am not intrigued by the idea of the SEC branching off and basically becoming its own entity and its own league and its own mini NFL. I have no desire to see that. I want to see, yes, the five-star talent-laden teams play each other on occasion. I don't want to see it every single week, week in and week out, because then it just becomes normal. Because somebody will not be at the top of the class. Well, somebody too. will go from being 9-4 and four or 8-5 and but, five or whatever to... Three and nine in a quick hurry. But yeah. big matchups are special because either of rivalries, so you get amped up for those games, no matter what the records are and all of that, 
but, you know, also the matchups you see in the postseason. The bowl games are fun because you see teams playing, you know, teams they normally wouldn't play, and now just kind of normalize everything to where – it's just all the same. One I, of the other things about not having big, big, big games every single week is then you look forward to the big games when they do right. come around. Where's the anticipation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And like yeah. the, the, uh, also, you don't have big, big games every week, but that's how, that's how Vanderbilt can beat Florida one day. Right. You know, and, and like, oh, my God. Yeah. Look what happened. Or you Kansas know? State can have success against Oklahoma and yeah. Texas. Or that Bill Snyder can turn around the miracle of all miracles. All right. Uh, one payment on 